Well, welcome everyone to uh, UPF's Peace Talk, our webinar series. We're very, very happy. We have a very large audience. We have an all-star group of panelists, a very timely and important topic that we're excited to present. Uh, we are living through challenging times. Of course, it's the time of the COVID crisis. And whether it's related or not, we're seeing uh, many uh, critical situations emerging around the world. Of course, the economic recession, but we're seeing rising tensions between two of the world's great economic and military superpowers, US and China. We saw recent uh, uh, flare up on the border between India and China. Uh, there are very serious issues being discussed in the Middle East. In my own country, we've had a series of demonstrations and protests over the horrible killing of George Floyd by a police officer and calls for criminal justice reform and addressing the uh, longstanding problem of racism. And this has spread to many countries. So it is a time of crisis. Our theme today is the role of women in times of crisis. And certainly the crises of this time are not in short supply. We have hope. We do believe that even forums like this that promote dialogue, uh, respectful, constructive conversation about critical and important issues can play a very, very important role in our world at this time. So I'm very, very happy for our panel. I want to move straight away to introduce our moderator for today. The panelists, many of them represent the International Association of First Ladies for Peace, which is a project of UPF and the International Summit Council for Peace in partnership with Women's Federation for World Peace International, without whose help and support, uh, this webinar would not have been possible. And on that note, I want to happily introduce Carolyn Hanshin. She is International Vice President of the Women's Federation for World Peace International. She also serves as WFWP's primary uh, leader in uh, Europe and the Middle East, has been based in Geneva for many years and does incredibly great work there while also raising her seven children. So uh, Carolyn, you take over from here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Walsh. Um, Women's Federation is honored to have been invited by the Universal Peace Federation to contribute to the development of the International Association of First Ladies for Peace and to help facilitate this important discussion today. Our discussion today, as Dr. Walsh mentioned, will be around a cross-cutting broader topic, the leadership of women in times of crisis and the creative and innovative solutions to the challenges that threaten our families, our homes and communities that are being designed and implemented by women. These are often different than those proposed by male leaders due to different priorities, other knowledge and experience. We are all well aware of the current pandemic and uh, the layers of loss and pain related to that. But today we'll look at this underutilized, relatively untapped resource of the unique leadership training that is learned in the role of first ladies. Their access to communities, their empathy and concern created through their service in a position of support to their nations and their husbands who are the heads of state or government. Before introducing each of our five uh, wonderful uh, speakers today, um, I would like to just uh, mention that each speaker will have uh, five minutes, six minutes, and we will leave time to have a discussion among speakers and then questions and answers. Uh, as the speakers begin, their bio will appear in the chat column to the right of your screen. And uh, 
for, we will not take time to introduce them at, uh, at length. And also, if you have questions and comments, you can write those in the chat box or send them to peacetalks at upf.org, as I think most of you know. And for translation, there is French and Spanish translation. One of our speakers will speak in Spanish. Um, and you can find the icon at the bottom of the page uh, with a menu of languages. It's a globe that you can click on and choose one of those languages. So, leadership of women in times of crisis. Our first speaker today is um, First Lady Debbie Romengasau, who is the First Lady of Palau, who actually cannot be with us in person, but has been very instrumental in organizing and um, you know, investing herself and uh, her heart and her incredible resources into the development of this new association of first ladies. She was co-sponsoring co the two first main events. Because she cannot be here today, uh, her speech will be read by Dr. Julia Moon, uh, who is the president of the Women's Federation International. And we are very honored to be able to um, to listen to these remarks and to have Dr. Moon with us. So Dr. Moon, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Carolyn, for your introduction. Um, Dr. Walsh and members of this prestigious panel of First Ladies, good morning and good afternoon. It is truly an honor to be with you for this webinar. Uh, I thank you, Dr. Walsh and Universal Peace Federation for this opportunity to be here today. Uh, Women's Federation for World Peace International and I are honored to work together with you to support the development of this unique and promising initiative, the International Association for uh, First Ladies of, uh, for Peace. Uh, the opportunity for women leaders to come together across sectors, including civil society and First Ladies is hopeful for the betterment of our troubled world. Along with their leadership, experience and knowledge, they bring a depth of concern, empathy, uh, heart and commitment uh, to the greater good in addressing a wide range of pressing social issues. Uh, just yesterday, I learned that uh, Madame Debbie Reminge Sao, uh, who was so instrumental in the regional and international inaugural assemblies of the International Association of First Ladies for Peace would not be able to join today's event. However, she wrote a very timely and profound message that I have the honor of reading to you. As you will hear, uh, rooted in her commitment to youth and protection of the beautiful, pristine nature of Palau, she describes a way forward. As a woman leader, she is outstanding. Her environmental campaign has won recognition and has mul been multiplied as best practice model around the world. Before reading the message of the First Lady of Palau, uh, I would like to convey the sincere hopes and concerns from the founder of UPF and WFWP. Dr. Hakta Han Moon has lived a life in loving support of the vision and mission for global peace of her late husband, Dr. Sun Myung Moon. The wealth of her experience and sacrifices over many years has given her a remarkable profile as a world level women leader. She is constantly inspiring and empowering women to be peace builders in our families, communities, and the world, and has great hopes for the outcome of today's discussion and the broader impact of women for a future peace culture. So without further ado, I would like to now read to you the official statement by Debbie M. Remengesau, First Lady of the Republic of Palau. Ladies and gentlemen, first and foremost, I would like to commend and congratulate Universal Peace Federation and Dr. Hak Jahan Moon for your steadfast leadership in the face of this global pandemic, a time of uncertainty and many challenges. I am regretfully unable to virtually join the liberations today, but I stand in solidarity with the global community as we work separately and collectively to address the unique obstacles and challenges brought forth by COVID-19. The Republic of Palau is among nine Pacific Island nations that have remained COVID-free. Since January, Palau's National Emergency Committee and other relevant government agencies 
have successfully developed strategic plans, protocols, and procedures to prevent the entry of COVID and prepare for the worst case scenario, COVID infection and transmission. We've closed our borders and adopted strict guidelines and developed a comprehensive plan governing our quarantine and isolation protocols. And fortunately, it has worked. We remain COVID free. COVID free does not mean we are unaffected. Like the rest of the global community, Palau has been extremely challenged by this pandemic. Like the global community, our friends and neighbors in the Asia Pacific region, our economy, health, tourism industry, and overall livelihoods has been greatly impacted. Through the leadership of President Tommy E. Remingensau Jr. and through partnerships with our closest allies, the United States of America, the Republic of China, Taiwan, Japan, Australia, and others, Palau has received outpouring support and assistance to help build our capacity and response and to effectively prepare <coughs> ourselves against COVID, against COVID. During this unprecedented time, the world must look to each other. The world must take action, must work in partnership and in solidarity. Only by working together can we successfully overcome our biggest challenges. COVID-19 has undoubtedly taught us a valuable lesson and that it does not discriminate against nationality, borders, age, and gender. The same lesson must be applied when we deliberate the urgency of our ocean's health and future. Marine pollution, unsustainable practices, illegal fishing activities, the use of plastic and other global challenges that contaminates and destroys our ocean and natural environment. It does not discriminate. We are all affected. We are all losing. And our livelihoods and our children's future are at stake. As we continue to participate in this dialogue, share our experiences and lessons learned, deliberate on solutions and best practices, let us also reflect on other global challenges, climate change, global warming, and many others. We cannot stop at deliberations and discussions. We must act. And these challenges will remain if we do not give our undivided attention and action. To effect change, we must act. To effect change, we must do more than deliberate and convene. As the saying goes, actions speak louder than words. As I said at the inaugural session for the International Association of First Ladies for Peace earlier this year in Korea, without a healthy planet, there will be no peace, only war, no security, only uncertainty. There will be no human development, only human decline. The health of our precious planet is inextricably linked to the health of the human race. COVID is an example of this. And while we work to address obstacles borne by COVID, let us not lose sight of other global priorities. As stewards of the ocean and the environment, as leaders, as public servants, as people, it is our responsibility to leave a safe, peaceful, and healthy planet that our children and their children's children can enjoy. Ke Kamal Mesulang, which means thank you very much. Uh, so this is the message from uh, uh, Madame Debbie Rebingen Sao. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Madame Rebingen Sao for her heartfelt message and for her great example in leading her country forward in these times of difficult times of crisis. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Dr. Julia Moon. And yes, we some of us had the opportunity to go to Palau uh, at the inauguration of the Asia Pacific Regional um, uh, International Association of First Ladies for Peace. And we could see the way that she is uh, responding to the environmental, the potential and real environmental crises there. And that when you arrive on her island, on their island, you have to actually sign a pledge that you will 
be very much um, responsible and aware of everything that you do while you're on that island. And it's a very, very moving kind of philosophy, actually, that they have that uh, I think touches everyone who goes there. So thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker, Dame Patience Jonathan, former First Lady of Nigeria, a nation of 196 million people. I'm a mother of seven children, but I can't imagine what it must be like to be feel responsible for 196 million people. So I think she is, uh, she, I know she's very active in many areas. She works with uh, Security Council Resolution 1325. She is doing many, many things and continues to be fully engaged. So uh, Madam Jonathan, we would love to hear from you. I want to commend the Universal Peace Federation for organizing this webinar and appreciate my co-panelists and the audience. Let me also use this opportunity to sympathize with all those who have lost their loved ones during this COVID-19 pandemic. I commend health workers all over the world walking around the globe to save lives, even at the risk of losing their own. The COVID-19 pandemic is a challenge that the whole world is facing. According to the United Nations, the coronavirus affects all segments of our population. It has affected governments, economics, our environment, healthcare system, businesses, employment, our children, education, families, the physical challenge, and our social life. The topic of today's webinar, the role of women leadership in time of crisis, is very important. We see Dr. Hajan Hanmoon and her leadership style of the UPF towards achieving world peace. We also see women all over the world showing great courage towards reducing the negative impacts of the coronavirus to our society. When this pandemic hits the world, most leaders did not expect the challenge it will bring in Africa. The case is not different considering the fragile state of our continent. Even though the numbers of deaths are lower than those in the Western world, Africa may be worse hit economically and socially. My NGO for Women for Change and Development Initiative has been working with key stakeholders to provide accurate information about COVID-19 so that families, particularly in the rural areas, can be stay protected. We are in partnership with the Bulldog Jonathan Foundation to distribute food items to some uh, state gov governments to families that are affected by the lockdown situation, especially women who run small scale businesses. We also partner with my successor, the First Lady of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, IGI Shabuhari, and her NGO, on a way to reduce the impact of the pandemic. This is similar to my, what my NGO did when I was the first lady of the Federal Republic of Nigeria 2010 to 2015. We deliver relief items to IDP camps all over the country. Also, as former president of the African First Ladies Peace Mission in 2013, I initiated effort to provide relief material to victims of violence and conflicts in Mali, Kenya, Sudan, Guinea-Bissau, Sahara Way, Arab Democratic Republic in Africa. My outreach, the Aurora Child Foundation has been involved in the issues of health and well-being of men and women and children. 
we intervene in so many cases to provide funds to families who have who have loved ones with heart condition so that they can travel out for surgeries. We also partner with the National Hospital to build a world-class hospital and with also with Apollo Hospital in Abuja so that those who are affected with heart condition can, be, can go for surgery. In adding to the new normals, my NGO is making plans to partner with some media organization, local radio station, and some national celebrities to collaborate on how to get messages in various local languages to more rural communities to avoid community spread. We are distributing face masks and sanitizer to those families and asking them to stay safe by wearing their masks in public places, maintain social distancing and wash their hands regularly and use sanitizer until we record zero case of COVID-19 virus. Women are good at taking initiative. So I am not surprised that all over the world, we are also at the forefront of managing this pandemic. In Africa, women are also working as doctors, nurses, and other caregivers, and their efforts have continued to yield positive results. In Nigeria, the Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs and Disaster Management and Social Development has a woman, Aja Sayi Uma Faru, is working on behalf of the federal government to reach out to the less privileged families. Several Nigerian women in the entertainment industry, sports, and various other industries has taken over the social media space to contribute in creating awareness that our people should follow the protocol of the federal government and the Center for Disease Control. After our meeting in South Korea, I paid the CVC to Her Excellency Aisha Aisha Buhari to discuss issues of their child education and increase in women participation in politics and governance. We are also working with major stakeholders to draw up training and skill acquisition program for more women and provide startup path for them. We are giving counseling support to women who suffer any form of abuse like rape and assault during the period of COVID-19. In most crisis situations, because women and children are more, most affected, we encourage our governments at all levels and the private sectors to support more women in leadership positions, policies, parliaments, and businesses. Although the issue of building a peaceful society is everybody's responsibility, women are critical stakeholders in nation building. So as I conclude, I call on women all over the world to continue to lead the crusade for gender equality and change for a better society. Thank you, the panelists. Thank you very much, uh, Dame Patience Jonathan, and for actually giving us so many, um, so much good news actually about all the work uh, that is being organized among women in the African continent and uh, your work across borders, creating partnerships, training, many, many things that we can discuss, we can go into more detail about later. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Honorable Emilia Patricia Alfaro de Fanco, former first lady and current senator of Paraguay. Um, she will speak in Spanish and uh, you will need to, to set your translation. We're very happy to hear with you all here. Walsh, to my greetings to Dr. Walsh, Dr. Julian Moon, 
este nombre de, to, de, de ellos. And, and a toda la all of them, I am a greetings to all the OPF organization. A special doctora, greeting to Dr. Hakya Han Moon, la madre, the mother. Saluda a todas las ex primeras and my damas, greetings to the former ladies este momento, in this so crucial moment in the world. Eh, a la Federación de Mujeres por la Paz to the Women Federation for World Peace. Also say thank you for having the chance to, to reach all the, the reality about the women here in Paraguay that we have been living during this pandemic. In Paraguay, we have passed two international wars. I want to talk about the 1864 to 1870, known as the Triple Alliance War. In that war, um, Paraguay lost 90% of his population. Of course, ma majority of men, being the women responsible for the reconstruction of the nation, role that he, they have uh, uh, faced with stoicism and, and courage. They didn't have a chance to, to cry or just to start working, take the the, the saw, uh, raise the children, uh, take care of the old guy, the old men, and the few, few men they were still sick and mutilated. Being this in a nation, they gave themselves so they live for others and service and work. They raised this nation. The women is very strong in capacity to bring together and, uh, and strength the uh, familiar links. In Paraguay today, the women is a sign of union, love, fight, and resistance. In this difficult situation around the world, it's not, uh, um, it's not new for Paraguay. So we have been one of the richest of the world. We have been able to uh, rule, to manage this pandemic very successfully, having at least uh, just 1,200 cases and only 13 dead people. With this population of almost 7 million people, we have a good results in health and, uh, and organizing schools, uh, universities are closed, and everything is paralyzed. And this, everything is closed, no business, no school, no universities, uh, the, the borders are closed. Everything is completely paralyzed. Let's mention that this, those women that are, were just doing cleaning, uh, working, they are doing their job at home, making a working from home, office from home, taking care of the kids. Uh, because they need to do to help them to do work, the homework, because they are not going to school. Uh, as you know, women they have some very important role in teaching uh, because they teach uh, virtually, um, becoming this, uh, this is an activity of more than three hours per day. <clears throat> also, this is some, uh, the role of mother also, we we need to take care of our being a, a noun. So women, in, the leadership of women in this crisis, uh, food, it's um, one of our more important papers of the world. Then women, the solidarity of the women is the one who is going to raise by organizing uh, women together, by cooking, uh, uh, community cooking, they fed a lot of people. They are in the first line facing 
as you know, the, there, are not, there is not enough uh, medical uh, people, so women need to go and do some support. Not, we need to mention also that the, the main government is, is, uh, is basically formed, the government is basically uh, formed by men, but then women are, they are not enough, so women need to take some role. And then, for example, we have a women uh, organizing the working secretary and industry secretary, and they are they are trying to stop the um, paralyzation of these uh, sectors of production. We need to empower women in all the activities so to be vital in this crisis, like for the the country, the production, agriculture, they, sometimes they are not so well uh, being treated, but now they are guaranteeing the surviving of, a, of the state, of the country. And so we need to, to, to train women in the participation in the field so they can work, make a note in the sector so they have, they can have a, a role with more equality. Also, we need to to bet for better leader, women leadership in time of crisis, which are being are proven they are best uh, birds best in doing. They are very fast in sending the message and very effective in, uh, at the head of government with very good uh, results. Now, more than ever, um, state needs to trust more um, in women, um, single women with children to become tools of surviving. Also, they need to ensure uh, good places of work, uh, incentivating the activities uh, of um, uh, working in companies and production. So this virus has demonstrated that we all are equal before the virus. Men and women and men rich, poor, whatever, they all are um, target of this virus. The unique uh, way we need to take responsibilities together. This is the great uh, teaching we need to learn. Let's take, let's take the negative from the, let's, let's take the positive from the negative. This, from this crisis, we have a new opportunity to build a better world with equality, with the same rights, uh, having the same opportunities and the same tools to go ahead, to overcome, to fight against, against this threatened, uh, and nobody being better than others. We all have to fight in the families. So we need to acknowledge the reawakening of each country, like in Paraguay, it's going to depend on the uh, uh, capacity of women to come up to the front. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Emilia Alfaro de Franco. Um, I remember well when we were in Korea too, you gave us a history lesson uh, of great, great women from Latin America, which is really very inspiring for all of us to hear. I really we appreciate that you put so much importance on that and that are being able to really learn from history and find models in what we are doing today from the work of great women uh, historically. Thank you for your great work that you are doing in your nation and uh, still being on the front line as a senator. Uh, our next speaker today is Honorable uh, Nayala Moawed, 
Wawad, former First Lady, former Minister of Social Affairs of Lebanon, still very active in social development today. And uh, she has been an MP for 20 years. Uh, Madam Wawad, we're very happy to listen to you today. You have the floor. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for organizing such a beautiful meeting so we can get to know each other. But before I tell you about the COVID, I must admit that I was a first lady for only 17 days. After that, my husband was assassinated and I had to, to fight to continue the work he had started. And I want to precise also that Lebanon, before the COVID, has witnessed a, a war, a Lebanese-Lebanese war, that had a lot of victims and uh, was against each other's confessional, confessionalism was prevailing and other, uh, other conditions as well. So uh, when um, my husband was elected president, I thought it would be the end of our uh, suffering because the, the, uh, the war, the, the Lebanese war, the Lebanese-Lebanese war had started very, very early and uh, that had lasted at least off and on, but it lasted about 20 years as well. But as soon as my husband was elected president, I thought that the first lady has many obligations. First of all, she has to be the first lady and uh, being near her husband in special circumstances, but also a first lady has to be near the people, has to be, to have the empathy with the people and has to know more about her, her people and the, the Lebanese people. So my first, uh, my first uh, initiative during these 17 days was to go in a very remote area of Lebanon that had just been liberated and uh, I, I spent the whole day there listening to people's complaints, what they wanted, to, what they were lacking of, what their ambitions were, and what I could do for them. And it still remained after my husband's assassination, where I took the place of uh, his responsibilities in our area, and uh, I became uh, uh, Parliament, uh, parliamentary uh, 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 responsible. And I did a lot, mainly in two things. Education, development, education. Development, it's human develop, uh, human development. And education is indispensable to make a human development. And development was very rare for women, education was very rare for women, and even most rare for children. So it has been my uh, ambition ever since, and I must say that I did work a lot, and I did work a lot on legislations for women and for children. Women having their rights, which they didn't have at all, and they were not very highly considered, and children who were working ever since eight years. I won't go into the details of the legislations, but I, I, I was teaching the fact that our children have to be all equals. They have to all go to schools, whether private schools or even better public schools, and we have to improve the level of the public schools. And women have to know they have a responsibility and their role is very, very important. So we had this war uh, uh, before the COVID and one slowly the war and the, the, the bad consequences of the war were fading off. We had the COVID-19 and it was a catastrophe for Lebanon. That, are already, that was already living and going through a dramatic uh, uh, situation, especially uh, concerning the, the living of the people, especially concerning the money that people didn't have anymore. 
and definitely the COVID came and added a terrible uh, burden on all this. And now we are really going through, through a dramatic uh, economic situation, a dramatic uh, scholar education, a dramatic um, situation on all of it. So I think we will continue talking about these subjects uh, when we finish our introduction, but we have to do a lot. And even uh, for the COVID, we had to develop also uh, as women and as responsibles, as members of parliament, as former minister, we have to, de to develop empathy and to go and see all the people. That's why also, I founded, I started a foundation that uh, uh, I called on the name, under the name of my husband, the Rene Howard Foundation. And uh, we are working very hard, especially in this situation where we are in, uh, assuring uh, 1,500 uh, elementary uh, gifts to many uh, areas in Lebanon. And it's not only the area that I represent as a member of parliament, but I always say my husband gave his life for Lebanon and I'm in charge of the whole Lebanon. I think it's better to continue and not to, to continue the conversations uh, amongst us. And uh, it's very important to get to know each other better to get to, to uh, and to help a more comprehensive project of uh, uh, being unified as first uh, uh, first ladies, former or uh, uh, actual first uh, first ladies, and to to benefit of our mutual experiences. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Honorable Naila Muawad. Um, Actually, Madame Moawad was the only one among our speakers who was not with us in Korea at the founding uh, of the International Association of First Ladies for Peace. But when she heard about it, she couldn't go, but when she heard about it, she was right away very enthusiastic. And uh, thank you so much. You, you really gave many um, kind of insights into how we can go forward actually in this with this organization as we are now starting to plan for the future. So thank you very, very much. Uh, our final speaker today, Mrs. Fenuola Kenny, wife of former Prime Minister Edna Kenny in, of Ireland, uh, actually first woman to head the Irish Government Information Service, but also a very active woman who just actually we could reach finally last night so she came in with really little warning but we're so grateful so happy that she was courageous enough to join us anyway so the floor is yours thank you very much thank you and good afternoon from ireland and i'm so pleased to see so many of you that we did meet in korea and that was only last february and it's very hard to imagine how the world has changed since that time and all because of COVID. I mean, it's certainly in my lifetime, I have never seen anything that equaled the impact of COVID-19, not a war, tsunami, 9-11 or other disasters, that this has been a truly global impact all over the world. Um, but, and I'd say that, that is the thing as has, has been said before by others, it is one of the things that COVID has shown us, how totally interdependent we are, that we all share this small planet and that really the virus has made no distinction between rich or poor, north or south, east or west. It, some of the wealthiest countries, in fact, like the, the US, has been one of the hardest hit countries in the world and Britain isn't very far behind. So hopefully in actually recognising that if something good is to come out of this experience is that we, we will recognise more that we are all bound together. And that what is in the interest of one is, is in the interest of all. I think that would, that would certainly be a big help. That, and, and looking forward that it will be, it will make a, a difference in international relations. Uh, another thing is to say that this virus has shown us, I think, 
is the need for our leaders to show truth, honesty, frankness and openness with people. And, and I think people have, where they have responded best is where their leaders have given them the real facts based on scientific and medical information. And that these countries that have done that, the citizens have bought into the very difficult but necessary um, measures that have been taken. Whereas in countries where there are far more mixed messages, where some people have been giving downright you know, telling untruths and in, in wanting to make it disappear, the virus disappear on its own, that this just hasn't worked. And I think that, again, it should be hopefully an ongoing lesson that if, if we want citizens to, to follow, um, as I say, a, a difficult regime, they, knew, they do need to understand the solutions and be given a clear and unambiguous pathway as to how to get there and why. Again, it's certainly true that countries that moved quickly had the best results. I mean, look at Taiwan, Singapore, Korea, Japan, New Zealand. And I think it, moving forward, and I am trying to look more forward than backwards. I mean, I, I think we all understand, you know, the horrendous impact it has had. But, you know, trying to look for what we can learn from it and looking forward. That um, I do think the World, the world Health Organization needs to be you know um, strengthened so that it can get, respond more quickly and more forcefully and more directly when and it, it, it is when the next pandemic happens not if I, I mean I firmly believe that this is the start of something that we're going to see much more of again one of the heartening things that came out of this crisis I believe is what has been the resilience adaptability the power of individuals and very small communities. I mean, in I, Ireland is a small country anyway, and you know everybody has been more or less kept at home, very much in their own community. And the the innovation, the the selflessness, the people helping each other, looking out for each other, the the power of each individual. You know hand hygiene, social distancing, things that we all can control for ourselves has been, has given people a sense of power, but also innovation, adaptability, and I think shown maybe the best qualities that we have. And, um, you know, people have adapted to, you know, a whole range of, of new practices, working from home, um, wearing face masks, which, I think I always find difficult if you can't see somebody smile at you and that's, we miss out, but still we adjust and adapt because we, we need to. As I say, helping neighbours. Again, industry, I know in Ireland anyway, has been remarkable in that, you know, a lot of small companies out of, out of the blue um, start diverted from their usual thing to manufacture PPEs, personal protection equipment, you know, some solutions, sanitizers, antibacterial soaps, a whole range of different things that were needed at the time. And they did that voluntarily without being asked or forced to do so. As I say, it showed a, a huge just sense of um, uh, community, but responsibility to the community as well. And I would like to think that, you know, businesses in the future can that can be tapped in again so say for other issues like environmental issues that 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 can be that sense of responsibility can be used again um, I, I do think you know, look, looking forward that you know life has changed forever I mean traveling airports um, and all, all that kind of thing I mean we can never go back to the way things used to be done so, and I, I do think there is a real need for um, not only the World Health Organization to, you know, be strengthened and, and brought up to date, but to much better research into what is likely to come down the tracks at us. And also th that there should be, you know, global depots for things like personal protective equipment. I know there was a, a huge problem worldwide initially trying to get that, trying to get solutions for the testing. 
all those kinds of things. There should be stores of those, and hopefully that we will learn from these things and put those those um, measures in place so that the next the next time that it happens or whatever happens, that we won't we won't be so slow to to catch up with it. But you know, uh, the measures that we that have been you know proven so far to work can't last indefinitely. You know, economies have to function. Children have to be educated, they have to go to school, they have to socialise. So lockdown isn't a viable op option in the long term. But I think we, if we relax measures, but in a planned and monitored way, then continue testing, that in the future, hopefully, targeted lockdowns will be all that is required and not huge global ones like, like we have been doing up until now. There's I say, another positive, that, and, and, and I know the, the um, former First Lady of Palau, that Dr. Moon read her speech, was referring to the environment. And, and I do think one of the positives of all of this has shown that has been the effects on the environment, that the diminishing uh, emissions and, and the lifestyle changes. And hopefully these are things that will be ongoing. Like, look at us here today doing a webinar instead of all congregating someplace, having flown maybe halfway around the world to get there. So I think there will be an awareness of that in both businesses. We're a little, we're running a little bit late. I think I have to, is it possible you could maybe? Uh, yes, of course. <laughs> of course. Sorry, yes. did I go on too Sorry. long? There's, there's, no, I just wanted to say anyway that, that I do think a power to, apart from the negatives, there are positives. We must learn to, to work together and to be in a truthful, open and honest way. And look, I'd like to thank you, to, uh, uh, Dr. Julia Moon and, and, and Dr. Walsh and the Women's Federation for World Peace for facilitating this. And hopefully it's only a small step in what will be a bigger and ongoing global cooperation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's exact, exactly what we're hoping for this too. Uh, Dr. Walsh, I wanted to ask you, should we take a question or two or should we have the discussion? We I think, uh, first of all, excellent, excellent panel, uh, great presentations. I think we have about 10 minutes left. I would suggest you invite the panelists if they would like to just make very brief comments, perhaps alluding to things they heard from the other panelists. And then if you have a couple of questions, maybe you could just read abbreviated versions of a couple of questions invite the panelists to make their final comment and perhaps address those questions. We need to wrap up in 10 minutes. Okay, as Dr. Walsh uh, mentioned, I, we take just a few minutes our, to have a, any kind of response to the presentation of others or any forward-looking ideas related to what we've been discussing today. In, in just a very, would anyone like to, to say something? I would like to say at first, uh, it was very interesting to hear all the first ladies and uh, Caroline, you are really a perfect uh, uh, organizer in this uh, sense. I just want to, want to, to say two things. First of all, I'm very proud of the Lebanese people because they were all one person because we had one common big, huge problem, which is the COVID-19. And uh, everyone tried to give something to the other one. Like today we are talking also, we have common points. And the most common point was the confinement that brought us to think of our lives and to see that we have been very uh, spoiled before. And we, go, we went back to our inner uh, personality and to see that we were interested by many things that were not very interesting and uh, 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 being uh, alone to think and being alone to help it's, it's fantastic and this is the, the big person of COVID-19 without mentioning the, the dramatic consequences of people who were uh, ill and mainly the people who died, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe one more. Is, is there one more comment or before I read a few questions? Yes, please, Honorable uh, DeFranco. 
Ok, gracias. Okay, thank you. No, comentar de que... I want to say, this is my, in my country, Paraguay, also, we are facing the crisis. Besides uh, what we all know, this uh, also we are hit, this, we are one of the more, we are less contagious, but very high in corruption, in the manage of government, public government. Please, all the governments who are healthy about that, because we have been able to create new organizations to face this uh, corruption. We have been creating better situation for health. And now in the middle of crisis, now this corruption became more evident because they, they found everything was collapsed before the coming of a pandemic. So please, really, we are, we suffer so much when we, we say this and also something that the women need to denounce because this is really striking us very strongly. And I just wanted you to know that. Thank you. Thank you. So maybe, so because we have questions from all of your regions, actually. Too many for us to read, but maybe I could just read a few of them, abbreviated form, and then we could take a minute, even less than a minute, for kind of a final word from each of you. To um, um, Honorable Patricia Alfaro de Branco, how families can earn income during this lockdown? How are they surviving? Is, how is the gov government able to support, and is there a way that women can help women to get through this in a better way. Uh, there were many questions about, actually not necessarily about the COVID virus, but about like things like violence, violence in the family or rape. And um, we have a question, um, gender-based violence recently in Africa, how do we combat this? Uh, and also how to raise our female children, our girl, the girl child, to be able to defend themselves and to really live in dignity. I think these are affecting actually all of our continents, not just you know, any particular one. Also, how do we change narrative about women in top executive positions? Currently, women in leadership roles have to adapt male kind of uh, characteristics in order to be accepted in some fora. Uh, how can we change that through our sort of solidarity and working on these issues together? Um, it has been my worry and concern for a long time about the role of first ladies and women, especially in Africa. Concerning donations for the COVID-19, there has been some misappropriation and corruption. What could a network of first ladies do to avert this crisis? Uh, Dr. Walsh, is there still time for a word from each one? I, th I think please invite each panelist to give a kind of closing 40 second uh, statement. Okay, so maybe we will go this time from the last speaker to the first speaker. Uh, Mrs. Kenny, could you start? Yes, I just like to take up the issue of domestic violence because in Ireland there was a very big increase in domestic violence while people were locked in at home and obviously frustrated and maybe seeing more of a partner they didn't really particularly like. And so I do think it's the responsibility of every government to put agencies in place where women can escape, can get out of bad situations. Okay, and uh, Honourable Naila. Well, when you are talking about violence at home, I must say that un very unfortunately, the confinement has uh, increased violences at home and women must be stronger. They have to refuse because when they don't accept the first time, it doesn't continue. And uh, we have so many things to talk about. What I wish and to, 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 to tell you and to tell Dr. Walsh, that we have to continue meeting each other so we can get enriched from each other and we can bring our countries together and we can bring our problems together. Thank you. 
Very good. Yeah. Okay, and then uh, Honorable Emilia Del Franco, yes. Just thank you to all of you. Dr. Walsh and Julia, please let's, let's get together, let's unite stronger, and let's make a big network of women, not only in the middle of this crisis, but, but, uh, but loving, but don't allow the deaths to come into our families and take our kids away, or our beloved ones. And please keep teaching values which you are being teaching us, the Christian values and the values that God has given us. Thank you very much. Let's keep getting together. Thank you. Uh, greetings to Dr. Dr. Hajjaham Moon. Thank you. That word will be passed on to her. Madam Jonathan, Dame Patience Jonathan, uh, uh, last word? Yes should be brought up to a speak without fear. It has been interesting. I hope, I hope from here we have something in our first body. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Dr. Julia, would you like to say a closing remark? Um, I was very inspired to hear all of our uh, first ladies speaking today. Um, I believe that um, uh, Madame Ramirez really uh, addressed the root cause of the crisis that we face today with COVID-19. Um, we refer to Earth as Mother Earth because it is the womb of life on this planet, the nourisher, the nurturer, and the ultimate giver of life. Uh, these were the words of our senior vice president, Sanjin Moon, which she, she expressed so eloquently. But we really do need to come together to take care of our planet um, and we must value the nature as the foundation for a healthy society and uh, really embrace a healthy and uh, green recovery. Uh, I think this is the way forward and Debbie Reverend Gansau expressed this very well. I really want to give great uh, gratitude to our founder, Haksa Han Moon, uh, for the inspiration of creating the International Association of First Ladies for Peace. I believe that when we can bring our knowledge and experiences together as women and um, with our maternal hearts, I think we can find the solution uh, together for all of these um, sometimes insurmountable problems that we face. Um, but together, uh, we can make small changes um, that start in the family that start, and then grows to the community and then to the world level. So thank you so much for this uh, time uh, to speak together, to share. And I'm very hopeful that the IAFLP can, um, we're just at the starting line, we're just beginning. Uh, and I hope that we can uh, do great things together for the betterment, betterment of our societies, communities, and the world. Thank you very much for this uh, wonderful webinar. Thank you. And Dr. Walsh, I hand the gavel back to you. Oh, very good. Uh, thank you, Carolyn. And thank you to all the panelists. Uh, fantastic, uh, brilliant uh, statements. And uh, I learned a lot. And I'm extremely encouraged. And I've been reading the chat. The chat is buzzing away with good comments and insightful comments about the many wonderful uh, statements that you have made. Uh, we do need to come to a close. I just applaud everyone. And I remind everyone, we will have a very important uh, Peace Talks webinar one week from today, beginning at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time in the US that is dealing with the future of the European Union and prospects for a rule-based global order, which seems to be under challenge. It will focus on the European Union. So I encourage everyone to join. We will send out announcements. There is a questionnaire at the end, but uh, I conclude just give my applause to the panelists and to the moderator and a wonderful, wonderful webinar. Let's keep it up and we'll do more of these in the future. Thank you, everyone. Brilliant. <laughs> it was good. Thank wow. you, everyone. That was really wonderful.